So now I would like to um, describe what the efforts in characterization. So again, the goal of the characterization is to reach a complete, hopefully base level characterization of every tumor within the body of the patient. And that, of course, we would like to do it at every cell in the body of the patient. That, of course, is still not feasible, but uh, that would be kind of the complete characterization, fully understanding what happens in the genome and epigenome of, of every cell in the cancer. So the solution is, of course, massively parallel sequencing, also known as next generation sequencing that enables base level resolution of the genome. There are many challenges due to that that we have been addressing in the, in the past decade or so, and I will kind of um, give you a few uh, examples of those. Um, the, the first one is the flood of data. Because of this drop in sequencing costs, we, the amount of uh, data is increasing dramatically. Um, we've started developing in 2009 a system at the, at the Broad Institute called Firehose to kind of analyze the world's data of cancer genomics. This at some point, um, the computers on the, in, in the Broad Institute were not um, strong and large enough to handle all the data. So um, there was an effort to together with the NCI also, to move these uh, analysis pipelines to the cloud and build an infrastructure to run um, pipelines on the cloud. And we built the um, FireCloud, which is now um, uh, uh, kind of uh, um, even further expanded to a system called Terra. And you're welcome to use them. And these are the, the URLs. And many of the, a lot of the data sets that are generated are available there. And, uh, and also many of the tools and pipelines you could, you could, uh, I then, you could find them and run in the, in the cloud. So in order to do next generation uh, sequencing base level characterization, here's a cartoon of what we're doing. And, and as you've learned previously in the course, you could take uh, DNA fragments, map them to the genome, and then we could identify point mutations by looking at uh, a kind of a uh, sites in the genome where, where the, the base in the cancer does not match the, the, the normal cells of that patient. We can identify point mutations and indels. We can identify copy number changes by the depth of sequencing. We could identify translocations or structural variations by looking at these pairs of reads and seeing that one part of the, of the read uh, goes to one place in the genome and another goes to a different place of the genome. And that helps us identify translocations and, and structural variations. And we could even pinpoint the exact breakpoint to the le base level resolution. And there are also methods to identify um, uh, non-human sequences like, like viruses that cause cancers by depleting known human reads and seeing what's left and then identifying uh, potential pathogens. And over the years, we've developed many tools to, for to addressing each one of these uh, questions. And I will give you some flavor of how how, the, what, how these tools work and, uh, and what they do. Hi, I have a question. Sure. Uh, how do you, uh, going back, how do you distinguish what is a cancerous point mutation versus what is just a normal, like a, a variant or a SNP that you can find across the population? I will discuss this in a, in, in a few slides, so we'll, okay. we'll get back to that in okay. a, soon. So first I want to talk about sensitivity and specificity for finding mutations. So. One thing that is different from the germline or uh, that people study, take you know, a, a blood sample and, ident and extract DNA from, from white blood cells um, is that ca a cancer sample uh, is a mixture of, no typically a mixture of tumor cells and normal cells. When you, you take you know, a biopsy and you extract the, the, the DNA, it's a mixture of normal cells and tumor cells. So, so this uh, um, poses some, uh, some complication for an analysis. What are the complications? That, that, uh, what's the, the effect of this mixture of tumor cells and normal cells in the tube? Is that we need to, uh, to assess what fraction of the DNA in the tube came from the tumor cells. So in order to do that, we need essentially two numbers. What's the purity? What fraction of cells were tumor cells? And what's the ploity? Which is what's the average uh, DNA content in a tumor cell compared to uh, the a normal cell. So uh, for example, uh, if you have a, um, a high purity, then of course you have more DNA coming from the tumor. If you have also hyploidy, you'll have more DNA coming from the, from the tumor, uh, a more fra higher fraction of the DNA coming from the tumor. So here's a cartoon of a cancer sample that has two thirds cancer cells and one third normal cells. And in this region of the genome, there are, there are uh, four copies 
in the genome in the cancer cell, but two copies in the normal cell. And, and here's a mutation, a clonal mutation shared by all the cancer cells in one of those copies of the four, of the four um, alleles. So what would be the expected um, allele fraction of this mutation? We have, we have uh, two thirds the, is the purity. The absolute copy number is four here. The mutation multiplicity, meaning how many copies of the mutation exist in every cancer cell is one. So overall, the, the allele fraction will be here 20%. And the reason is you could count. Two alleles are mutated out of all together 10 alleles here. You know, two here and four plus four is 10. And two out of 10 is 20%. So the allele fraction of the mutation, if you sequence deep enough, you'd expect 20% of the reads to have the mutation and 80% of the reads not to have the mutation. So we could calculate a simple formula and say the, the allele fraction or expected allele fraction of a mutation is the multiplicity in the, in the cancer cells times the purity of the cancer divided by the purity times the local copy number, which would be four here, times one minus the purity, which is the normal cells, times two, because there, because there are two alleles coming from normal cells. That's, of course, uh, um, assuming we're, we're talking about kind of the, not kind of X and Y chromosomes, the, the, the autosomes. What happens if the mutation is only in the part of the cells, let's say in half of the cells? So here in this cartoon, imagine that only half of the cells have the mutation. Of course, this would also affect the allele fraction, because now only one allele out of the 10 have a mutation. So it's, it would be 10%. A allele fraction. So if you sequence deep enough, you'll find on average 10 uh, uh, out of the uh, reads will have the, the mutation. So the, the actual formula now has the CCF here, the cancer cell fraction in the formula. So if you want to calculate an allele fraction of a mutation, you need to take the CCF times the multiplicity times the purity divided by, by this deno same denominator, and you'll get the expected allele fraction of the mutation. When we run an algorithm to find um, somatic mutations, we, we, it's essentially running a classifier for every position in the genome. And like every classifier, it has false positives and false negatives. And we could characterize the quality of the classifier using ROC curves. Um, and and as, as you know, this is kind of the, the sensitivity, uh, um, as a function of, of the one minus the specificity or the false positive rate. In, in, in our tools, there are many parameters that affect this ROC curve. Of course, the allele fraction of the mutation uh, would affect. The lower the allele fraction would be more difficult to find the mutations. The coverage, the depth of sequencing, sorry, um, the depth of sequencing, will, the higher the coverage will give us more power to detect the, the mutation. And of course, the noise level in the system, the higher the noise will have less ability to find mutations. So now I want to give you um, a bit of an example of Mutex, which is the algorithm that we've developed um, that, and we still use until today to um, uh, analyze and find somatic mutations in, in cancer. And I'll get back to the question about tumor and normal in, in a second. So first, this, the sensitivity to find mutations. So, the frequency of single nucleotide variation is roughly one mutation per megabase in the, in the genome. Of course, it varies quite a bit, but just to give you a sense, it's one in a million bases is actually mutated in, in, the, in the cancer, at least clonally in all the cancer cells. So let's imagine an, uh, an experiment where you sequence this sample that has a, a, a mutation that is, in this case, it's a subclonal mutation with an allele fraction of 0.1 and you sequence it to a depth of 30x. So every part of the genome is covered by 30 reads on average. So let's say this site with a mutation is covered by th exactly 30 reads. How many reads do we expect that will have the mutation? This is just a binomial distribution with a, with a P of the, of the coin at 0.1. So there's some probability, 4.2%, that we won't get any read with the mutation. And there's you know, some probability of 14% to get one read and two reads and three reads, et cetera. The, the expected value is of course three because it's 10% out of, of, 30, of 30X. So the theoretical sensitivity of the, um, of the of a mutation caller, any algorithm, the theoretical sensitivity cannot exceed in this case, 
96%, because in 4% four, in 4 of the cases, there are no reads with the mutation. So of course, no, no algorithm will be able to figure out that there's a mutation if there are no reads with the mutation. And if you have a very kind of a easy, excitable uh, um, uh, algorithm that even with a single read with a mutation will call a, a variant, then, then uh, you, you will be able to, to find it in, in at least 95% um, of the cases, have more or one of the reads. And, and then if you need two or more reads at 80% and you need three or more reads, you'll, 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 your sensitivity will be 60%. So now, I, now comes the, uh, how we find distinguished somatic from germline. So you've, you've learned about IGV, I think. And um, uh, this is a, a snapshot from IGV where we look at the position in the genome. And here you could see a, a pileup. Of, of reads that have this, um, you know, this mutation here, this blue mutation, where in the normal there is none. So this, when you look at it, you say, oh, it, maybe it's a mutation. In fact, in this case, it's not a mutation. It's just a sequencing noise that happens to be, happen to be here, but not in the tumor, but not in the normal. And this is one of the type of false positives that we have. We are, when we compare the tumor to normal, we, that normal is clean. We don't see any, any mutation and any variant there in any, none of the reads, let's say. And in the tumor, we see in a few reads, but this could be just due to sequencing error. There's another type of, of uh, mistake that we could make is when this site is actually a germline SNP. And for some reason, the normal was not sequenced to a high enough coverage. So we saw only one read representing this heterozygous SNP here in the, in the site. Um, but in the tumor, we see many reads with heterozygous, uh, with this um, uh, variant. So we say, oh, this seems to be a somatic mutation because we see so many reads in the tumor. There's nearly no, only one read in the normal. Maybe that's just noise in the normal. And therefore we make a mistake. We call it a somatic mutation, but in fact, it's a germline SNP that just happens to be hidden in the normal. So, we, these sites are, these type of mistakes are less common in the genome because they're just less germline variations in the genome compared to places where you could have um, sequencing errors. But we need definitely to measure these two types of errors and, and distinguish when we look at the type of, of um, at sites that are at germline variation, at BB SNP sites, versus at sites that are not in germline uh, variation sites. Typically, because we sequence the normal deep enough, we rarely make this mistake. As long as we make sure that the normal is covered deep enough, we rarely make the mistake of, of the, um, it's actually a germline. Most of our mistakes are in the in this sequencing uh, artifacts. So let's, let's kind of uh, dig deep a bit and get some intuition about that. Um, you, I think you've learned about sequencing and the quality scores that are coming out of um, of the, in addition to the base that is sequenced, there's also a quality of that base representing what's the likelihood that this base is a, is a mistake. Typically, we see um, qualities around the 30, or even a bit slightly higher than 30 um, in, in the, uh, when we sequence samples. So that means that one every thousand bases is a mistake. So if there was an A there, it could be either G, C, or T, each one with roughly, let's say, one over 3,000, um, if we assume they're equally likely, the, the different mistakes, which are typically they're not, but if we assume that, it's roughly one over 3,000 um, um, uh, uh, to each one of these mistakes. Now let's assume that there are these, every read has independent errors, which is a wrong assumption, but for now let's assume that, and we sequence to a depth of 30x. What will happen? 97% of the sites, if you look at them at 30x, will have no variant in them, no, no error, not, no um, sequencing error. But 3% of the sites in the genome will have one error. So if you had a mutation caller that would call even with one, one non-reference base, will say there's a, there's a somatic mutation here, you will call mutations in 3% of the genome. And we know that cancer is mutated in one in a million. So you'll definitely be swamped with false positives. Now the probability to have uh, two, two errors that are going to the same base, so the A goes to G in both of them, is, uh, is uh, you know, 0 0.00014, which is still more than the one in a million mutation per megabase. So even if your mutation color would be 
excited by two base, two reads that support the same mutation, it, you will be swamped by false positive. With three or more that are the same, going to the same allele, then you're, you're starting to be lower, just slightly lower than the expected um, mutation rate. So your false positive rate is, is you know, roughly half of the, of the rate of the, uh, um, of the somatic um, mutation that you expect. So that shows you the intuition why we need typically three or more reads in order to call um, a somatic mutation in a 30x coverage. If you sequence to 30 to 1000x, then these numbers would change and you need more to be confident that this is not coming out from noise. So if I go a bit to the math that, that is in Mutex, in Mutex we are doing this log likelihood ratio test, essentially, or testing this log score, comparing two models. One, that the site is mutated in the tumor it's, uh, with some mutation M with allele frequency of F, but in the normal, there's no mutation. So there, there's the, the, the allele fraction is zero in the normal. So how do we calculate the likelihood? The likelihood is the probability of observing the data given the, the parameter, the errors of every base, what is the reference base, what's the mutant base, and what's the allele fraction. And if we assume the reads are independent, we could break this to this product of probabilities. And then each one of these, we could still using this, this um, uh, kind of uh, formula. If the base is the reference base, then when we see a, in a read a reference base, it could be that it came from the mutant, but the mutant had a mistake to the reference. So this is the error divided by three. Again, assuming that all the three, all the three different mistakes are equally likely. And, or the base was from a non-mutant one minus F and was not, there was no error, so one minus E. So these are two options of getting, getting in a read a reference base. Getting in a read a mutant base could be that it's truly, truly a mutation coming from a true mutation and there was no sequencing error in the mutation, or there was no mutation in that read, in that molecule that was sequenced, and there was a sequencing error that made it look like the mutation. And if there, for all other bases that are not the reference or the mutant allele, it's just the probability of making a, an, an error there. So we, we use this and we calculate this, um, uh, this likelihood for the model of particular, uh, for, for particular frequency. And the frequency we actually use is the, the observed frequency of um, the kind of the, we approximate the maximum likelihood frequency by taking the observed frequency of, of uh, non-reference uh, uh, bases in the pilot. So then we could calculate the, the log score where we're comparing the, the mutant uh, uh, version of the, the likelihood times the prior the, of, the, of being muta mutated. And we compare to a model where there's no mutation there and then, um, and then times the prior of it not being mutated. And if this is greater than some threshold, um, we call it a mutation. The threshold we use is, is for this delta is T, meaning that we want at least to have twice as much likelihood of being mutated than not mutated. Um, if you plug in the priors, given that uh, mutations are roughly in, uh, you know, in, uh, on the order of, I don't know, three mutations per megabase in this case, and uh, uh, in this assumption, we, we, we end up with um, this threshold in, the, in this log scale of roughly 6.3. And if the log score is greater than 6.3, we call it mutated, and if it's less, we call it um, uh, not mutated. But this is not enough. After this um, uh, log score, we have different additional filters, which are probably representing the fact that the, the statistical model is not accurate, and we're working now to even improving this statistical model. Um, and um, there's a question here. Yes. Yeah, so, so sorry, can, can, can you go back to the previous slides? Uh, which sure. Formulas? Um, uh, no, that's going forward. Yes, please. Yeah, sorry, I, I feel like the probability doesn't add up to one. I don't know. The probability adds to one. So this one, this plus this, one minus F times, F times this time, F is just E over three. So from this and this, you get E over three. From this times this, you get one minus E. 
So you get E over three from here and one minus E from here. And there are two other options because there's reference and mutant and then two other bases. Oh, oh okay, okay, two and other this, options. Uh, yeah. And, and this is the two, two thirds and it adds up to one. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Okay, great, thank you for checking this. This is a good check. Um, so now the, 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 uh, also the assumptions of the, the fact that the reads are independent is incorrect um, because noise is correlated between genes and therefore we are, we are working on improving the, the method. One of the ways of, of, that we found that is improving the methods significantly is having a panel of normals. And the panel of normals is basically having many different normal samples sequence and we look at them at that site to estimate kind of what's the, the, the noise in that site and, and therefore um, uh, having this filter. And uh, we have two types of these panel of normals. I won't go into that, but um, uh, these are uh, dramatically improving our, our uh, specificity. So how could we measure our, our specificity and sensitivity to generate this ROC curve to measure the quality of the mutation color? We, we have this um, uh, experiment that we did. We, we took um, a sequencing of NA12878, which is a, a known uh, normal sample that is sequenced many times, and we sequenced it twice, the same sample twice. It's, a, it's not a cancer, it's a normal. And one of them we call it the normal, and one of them we call it a cancer. If we try to cause somatic mutations by comparing this tumor to this normal, then we, um, we would find all of our false positives because there shouldn't be any mutation found we compare the same sample to itself. It's just differences in the sequencing libraries, etc. It's not, it's not um, a, a true somatic mutation. So this is, we measure the specificity. For the sensitivity, we take a related sample. It's the, the, the daughter or the, or the parent of this sample. So where we have SNPs in the genome where this sample is different from this SNP, uh, uh, a heterozygous SNP, that this is different from this one. And we, and we basically um, spike in reads from this sample, replacing reads from, from this original uh, sample here at whatever allele fraction we want. So we could control the allele fraction and then we could measure, now we know where the mutations are because we know exactly where the SNPs are here. And, we, and then we compare this virtual tumor to this virtual normal. And then we see, can we detect the mutations? We could do this uh, by simulation. We could also do it analytically by kind of uh, modeling it. And this is what we came up. Um, for different allele fraction, we could see the different sensitivity curves depending on the sequencing coverage. If you sequence to 30X and the allele fraction was 0.05, there's a very small chance you'll find the mutation. If it was 0.1, there's a 60, a percent that you find the mutation. If it was 0.4, there's a very high chance that you'll find the mutation. The, 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 these little dots here are from this uh, simulation that I just showed you before with the, the spiking in of, of different reads. Um, the, the, the solid line is from a kind of theoretical curve calculation, which fits quite nicely to the, to the, uh, um, to the simulation data. When we, when we did this, we compared different mutation color at that point, and, and looking at the same level of false positive rate, which is what we want to be kind of way below the, the one mutation per megabase, we saw that Mutect was the best, uh, um, uh, had the best kind of sensitivity uh, for this same level of, of uh, false positive rate. So uh, we, were, um, we, we showed that our method is much more sensitive than all other methods that were available kind of uh, at that time. And, and other tools are improving and our tool is also improving. There's a third uh, form of false positive, which is also important to keep in mind, which what happens if in the lab or part of the processing of the sample, some DNA from a different individual contaminates the DNA from this tumor. So then when we compare this DNA that is a, has a little bit of this other person and to, this, to the normal of this individual, we will see situations like this, where we'll see a few reads in this tumor but those reads are coming from this other individual. And of course, it's not in the normal. It's also not in the tumor of this, of the, of this individual. It's just in this other non, non, uh, different person. And we will call a potential somatic mutation there. So we, we developed a tool called Contest to estimate based on, on, the, on looking at, at uh, different SNP sites, estimate the, the, the contamination level of 
different individuals in the sample and use and then we use this quantity back in mutex to to make sure that our our norm our model the null model is not that there's no mutation there but in fact that there's a could be a mutation there at the rate of this contamination and that uh, that makes our tool less sensitive but but also um, uh, avoid making the mistakes due to this um, uh, contamination so if there are, are there any questions on so far until this point? Just. All right, working on. 